Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. All right, here we go. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast today. I am very thrilled to have my guest today, Lou LeBenz. Lou, welcome. Thank you, Guy. Lovely to be here, and thanks for asking me. I appreciate that. You're so welcome. So Lou has spent nearly 20 years of her life as a therapist, and she's done a lot of work in the areas of addiction, eating disorders, and trauma. She's currently on the, in the process of writing an online program for people who've experienced trauma, mostly because, as she says, she doesn't believe there are enough affordable options out there, and trauma is an area that's all too apparent in today's society. Lou wants to help in this area specifically, mainly because after much training and development, she believes she has some valuable insights, both personally and professionally, to offer. And her long-term hope is that some of them may be helpful on a wider scale. Lou, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. So this is kind of crazy. This is, I, I was like, for, I don't know what I was doing. I was looking at something in an email that came across you. And I think I might've been sending out invitations. And I'm like, where's Lou? How come you've never been on this podcast? And it's been, in, so this is, it's a no brainer to have you on here. Um, I think you're such a, a, a a force in the field, a much needed voice in the field, and you're an inspiration. I might cry. <laughs> well, it's the truth. That's a good start, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's I feel truth. really touched. And, and do you know, it's funny. I spoke to my dear friend and your friend too, probably Shari, and said, do you know, guy, Guy's never invited me on. And she said, why don't you ask him? <laughs> why don't you just ask him you know and we met didn't we through other means so I'm just really delighted to be here and I, I hope I've got something valuable to share to your audience and um, it's always great to work with you guy too and I know that you've come on and done my podcast which I'm very grateful for too so yeah I love collaborating well we'll talk about that and your thriving online your Facebook group trauma thrivers yeah. we'll talk about that but let's okay. let's get into it here so okay. how did you get into this field what pulled you drew you into this field well i didn't come into it until about my mid 30s so i had a very circuitous route before um, I ended up in rehab and, and, and my two hours before that was I worked in the rag trade firstly and then I worked in the radio industry so in London and then I got a call from my mum at about I think I was about 30 and she was up a mountain in Italy with my alcoholic stepfather and he'd relapsed, not for the first time, the second time. And so I kind of ended out up, up a mountain in Italy, nursing him, trying to get him back to the UK and into treatment. And what was a really interesting, um, quite a long time, two years really. And um, eventually we left Italy and, and we sold the property and we came back to the UK and I thought, well, I don't want to go back into radio and media. It was very frenetic and quite high pressured. And I think the experiences that I'd been through with Chris, my stepfather, eventually after some NLP and hypnotherapy training led me to, um, there's a treatment center in the UK called the Priory, which is quite well known. And at the time they were doing a six months addiction therapy training course. And so I did my NLP and I did my hypnotherapy in my, in my kind of mid thirties or, or coming up to mid thirties. And then I did this six month training. And very luckily I got a job at the Priory in Roehampton, which is a big treatment center over here off the back of it. Um, and I was about 35 and then I embarked on, doing all of my psychotherapy training and adding to my addiction therapy qualifications. And I spent 10 years in that rehab, seven of which were on the addiction unit. And it's funny, guys, isn't it, looking back? I mean, I am going back 20 years, but, you know, 
I was saying to somebody this week, trauma wasn't really around in addiction then. We didn't really mention the word. And I had a now friend of mine who used to come in in the old days and she'd been out to Arizona and done some stuff with Pia Melody um, and came back with some of that stuff and something called a trauma egg. And it was really funny because Annie would come in and do this trauma egg in the treatment center and we'd go through 20 or 25 clients and go you've got trauma you've got trauma and you've got trauma so you three or four go off and work with Annie for the day on the trauma egg but everybody else hasn't got trauma <laughs> you know and and I look back at it now and I think oh my god what were we doing we kind of didn't recognize trauma and I really in those days didn't recognize trauma myself. I didn't realize that my codependency and my addictions and all the rest of it were born out of trauma. And really that became known probably a decade or so ago when I started to do all my EMDR training and everything else. It's like, oh my goodness. And saw the ACE score for the first time, which is the Adverse Childhood Experiences Scale, and worked out, oh my God, I've got a sick score on there. So my, my route into trauma therapy, I suppose, only happened really about eight or nine years ago. The first 10 or 11 years was quite oblivious to it in any mm. real degree. And I'm, I'm just being honest, guys. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. You mentioned after uh, the experience with your, your stepfather on that mountain, you said you were doing NLP and hypnotherapy. Was that to help you decide what shift you were going to make after, after the radio? Yeah, it, it was really. And, and also it was because I'd come back from being up a mountain you know, and we were up there for three years and but you said literally was, is that you're literally up a mountain, you're saying. Yeah. Well, the okay. house was very isolated where my mum lived. And so it was literally up a mountain in, okay. in Italy, in Umbria, which is south of Tuscany. And, you know, we spent a lot of time working with my stepfather to get him into treatment, which was fairly traumatic. Uh, and I remember having to drive him to AA meetings in Florence, which was a very long way away. And we would drive up the motorway and have to stop mm -hmm. at every motorway cafe at the time so that he could have a drink so that we could then continue the journey. Oh. So, so we had all of that. And then we had various shenanigans trying to sell my mum's house, which were quite traumatic fake shakes and all sorts of things going on and so by the time I made it back to the UK I was pretty um pretty traumatized and really not very able even to think about going back into a work environment because I'd been so socially isolated for so long mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I did start with the NLP and I did start with the hypnosis, but I missed out. I actually started with personal training before that. So I trained as a personal trainer. And just when I came back from Italy, I was actually a cleaner because I couldn't speak to people 20 years ago. I couldn't hold a conversation with anyone. So I had to become what we call a merry maid where I was just cleaning people's houses because then I didn't have to engage with anyone. What do you mean you couldn't speak with people because of that experience? Because I think the trauma was starting to back up because I think you know the time with, with my stepfather was so traumatic and because I hadn't really worked for three years. Mm. So I'd been very, very isolated and my confidence had gone right down. So, you know, the NLP and the hypnotherapy and everything that helped me to, to a certain degree with that. But I, I suppose it was Chris and the addiction and at the back of my head thinking there was something going on with addiction that led me to do the six month addiction training. And that was really what opened my eyes to a, wanting to be in the field, but also be realizing my own story, 
I mean, mm. I, I know that I've shared with you before that, you know, 10 years previously in my early 20s, I'd been sectioned with psychosis to a to a psychiatric hospital in the UK. So so the lid had already blown off once. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'll admit it. And I don't know who's listening, who is a therapist, but I had a hell of a lot of work to do on myself. Uh, when I first came into the field too. So you get into the field. I mean, you, you, you uh, get your training, talked about EMDR, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's one thing to practice as a therapist and to take these trainings, but you're, you've obviously clearly taken a step further and said, you know what, I want to get out there and I want to help people I mean, you've got a group called Trauma Thrivers, right? It's on yeah. Facebook. So yeah. it's, you're helping people who've been impacted by trauma. Why, why did you start that? Why, why that push to do that? Because once I recognized that I had trauma myself and I hadn't really realized, I thought how many other people are in this situation? How many other people have symptoms of trauma, firstly, that they're completely unaware of? You know, how many other people are going to see therapists or clinicians who might be more on the motivational end or the NLP end? And, and I went to so many people uh, on that scale trying to quick fix me, if you like. Um, and, and so part of my remit is we have to get the trauma world world out there, not, not just in therapy, but I believe, and I, I, I hope you do too, that we need to become a trauma-informed world. And that's not just in therapy, that's in corporates and schools and education and the criminal justice system. Like trauma needs to be understood at a whole big societal level. And so... It, it took me so long to realize it myself. And I wonder if in my early days of training or even in my twenties, when I'd got admitted, you know, with psychosis, if somebody had said, oh, you might have trauma, you know, it might be your early childhood trauma and all the six or seven things that had accumulated before my mid twenties, why don't you go and work on that? It, it could have saved two or three decades. Wow. And, and I want that for other people. In, in your experience in, uh, in your Facebook group, when people come to you and they, and they join, let's say, what are you seeing? What are some of the things that people are saying in terms of, oh, I didn't realize that could be traumatic or I didn't realize this could be traumatizing? They're saying lots of things. I suppose, if I'm honest with you, Guy, by the time they've come and and Googled trauma thrivers, they know about trauma. Right. <laughs> so they are the lucky ones that somebody out there has gone, mm, that sounds... That sounds like trauma, but I think generically what's lost in the, in, in the trauma conversation is still everybody thinks it's a big one-off event. Right. You know, trauma has to be uh, a tsunami or, a, or a, you know, a war or a rape. It has to be almost single incident. And what I'm seeing still is that nobody seems to understand that developmental piece and about the constant, they think you have to have had real abuse. And I say that in inverted commas, because what the hell does that mean? They don't understand about the co-regulation and the being soothed and the nervous system and how important those at that attachment period is and being seen and heard and mirrored and, and, and all of that. And that not getting that, is is the beginning and the essence of trauma mm -hmm. and i so, suppose if we could educate people that that's really what trauma means that trauma is not this big one-off but it's it, it it covers all of that area and that really when we're talking about trauma we are talking about a dysregulation of the nervous system mm -hmm. i think that would help an awful lot of people get their heads around it 
Yeah, you know, I, I'm just thinking to myself, I mean, it was clear that you should have been on this podcast a long time ago. And, and I really enjoy talking to you because it's it's clear you're 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 giving of yourself in what you're doing. You're sharing your own uh experience, your own wonderings, your own failings, your own flailings, your own dedication and persistence and perseverance. Um, what do you think it is, Lou, that enables you to get in there and work with people? What is it about you, about your experience? I think that, well, I'm going to come back to me being able to share it and get out there and share my experience. And, and I'm going to say to anybody listening that that took me 15 years to do. So my early days as a therapist uh, I did not share my story I didn't put myself out there and you know clinically we know that how much of us comes into the room anyway it, it, it's not very often that in a session with somebody I will disclose I will only disclose absolutely appropriate for that client in that moment and the only reason I got to be able to, to share my story, if you like, and come out from behind the clinical screen, which we we do do a little bit, us therapists, we do kind of do don't share, don't self-disclose, don't put your stuff out there, is because I did a TEDx five years ago and I had to share part of my story. Um, but I also overcame a really really extreme glossophobia where I couldn't speak at all and and part of my this is going to sound slightly wacky but bear with me those of you that are listening part of my psychosis was in having a few visions so I was really lucky I was a happy psychotic um, and in my happy psychosis one of the visions that I had and I think it was very symbolic, not actually factual, was that at the end of my psychosis, I ended up on stage with Oprah Winfrey and the Dalai Lama. So not I bad, forgot not about bad company. It. Yeah, great, great company. They were heroes of mine at the time. And it's all I'm saying very tongue in cheek. That vision stayed with me for like 10, 15, 20 years. And I couldn't speak, I couldn't find my voice, I couldn't stand on a stage, but I still thought, oh my God, maybe part of my uh, destiny, if you like, or vision is to learn how to speak and mm -hmm. find my voice and put my story out there as part of educating around trauma rather than being in the one-to-one -one scenario, maybe there's an opportunity to build trauma thrivers and do the one-to-many. And I think that because I think the more that we can educate and the more that we can get out there and people like you on the podcast and anybody that's listening and start telling people about this, it's going to have more of an effect in the long term because we need loads of us guy with podcasts and trauma groups and spreading the word about trauma. Well, let's, I mean, I kind of feel, so I don't know whether that answered your question, it but did. I kind of thought it was important to some therapists listening that, you know, they might not be ready to share their story or even put themselves on a TEDx yet, but at appropriate times and appropriate sharing is really, really helpful, I think, in the mission that we're all on. I completely agree. And I, I feel that's uh, uh, a part of relating as a human being. And especially within the context of trauma, it, it's crucial for that, for that uh, element to, to be there. You know, I kind of feel like we, I dance a little bit around Trauma Thrivers, but share with our listeners what is the Trauma Thrivers group? Well, it was set up a couple of years ago, and it was set up to talk about the thriving end of trauma. Um, because I think there are many of us, and therapists included, that do find it quite hard to put our voices out there or be visible or feel worthy enough that we can increase our prices or do that kind of end stage of our trauma healing. So 
originally it was set up up more more for that but it, it seems where we share the best practice research we support each other um, there is a place for sharing with professionals of what they're doing in the world um, each week um, and it's just a nice great space to be so if anybody's listening that wants to come join and that's on facebook yeah, come thrive with us. but you also do a cool thing where you invite people you kind of do you have tr uh, live interviews which is really cool yeah. i was fortunate to take part in that it was really interesting what's yeah. your idea behind that well the live facebook's were really a bit like a live podcast so that people could attend live that are in the group and they can ask questions and get involved and feel like they're joining us actually at the moment that we're doing it so we have all sorts or i have all sorts of guests coming in usually on a thursday from bless Stephen Porges and you guy, um, you know, down to last week, we did sand tray therapy with a lovely woman called Masha. The week before was a guy, Freddie, who I used to work with at the Priory, who's now an eco psychologist. So all of it's with a trauma frame, but it's just the different ways people are working with trauma. Okay. And you also have a podcast. What's the name of the podcast? <laughs> the trauma thrivers podcast okay well there you yeah. go branding continuity right there yeah yeah and how long yeah. has that been going on for that's been going am i allowed to say ever since i did your course there you go yeah okay, which so was you, brilliant right, so guy right. you helped me get the podcast launched by doing your podcast course that was exciting that was yeah. exciting um and your the goal there with the podcast is similar. How would you describe that? Really, the podcast is just about disseminating knowledge. So uh, about a year ago, I did a free ebook. You've probably seen it. It was like um, it's called the Solutions to Healing Trauma, and there are fifty six different methods in there. It's and and you can get it off the website forward slash ebook, and it's got everything from sensory motor, somatic experiencing, EMDR, to I don't know shamanic healing, um, psychodrama, um, HRV, heart rate variability, different uh, other techniques, new technologies, just because I was really confused when I came into the trauma field about oh, what therapies are there and what work with trauma and what don't. So this is just a book for people to go, here you go, there's, there's some methods that might help because there's never, never in my experience one route to Rome or right. road to Rome. There are so many, aren't there, different methods and modalities that the podcast was really about trying to interview people that were somatic experiencing practitioners or were eco-psychologists or were, I don't know, uh, had tried the psilocybin journey, you know, cause I'm, I'm fascinated with all of that. Right. Right. Um, one of the, you know, you talked about sharing your own story, doing that ethically and, and appropriately, of course, was the, has, was that difficult for you when you started doing that? It was it was really difficult for, for me. I felt um, I felt that uh, the therapeutic community might um, ostracize me to start with in a way because it didn't feel right about clients watching my TEDx or hearing my story out there or seeing it on social media. Um, but in the time that I've done it, um, no client has ever come back to me and said that it's been a negative effect on them. If anything, it's been hugely positive and mm -hmm. uh, cathartic for them. And, and I feel that now I'm kind of spreading out a little bit from the one to ones and doing one to many and groups and speaking more that we love stories don't we? We want to hear people's stories that as you're right, that's how we connect. And 
I always think that clients, if they think that you understand them a bit and you can fully empathize, I don't know. I, I think sometimes it touches them a bit more. Right. And of course, that 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 thinking of uh, you know, sharing uh, self-disclosure, right, was taken from the psychoanalytic model where nothing was shared of, of the, the therapist themselves. Um, but this idea of, you know, when, when someone walks into, when a client walks in and they feel who's experienced trauma and they feel like that other person, that therapist sitting across from them is unscathed, untarnished, untouched, you know, a therapist, my God, of course, they're going to have a, what the dynamic in the room is completely skewed, yeah. you know, and being able to, to relate to the therapist and to know that, like you said, that they can understand you that they they even uh, themselves have had certain experiences. It settles the mood, the the tension, the stress in the room. Um, I think it's so important, you know. And again, we're we're not talking about just wantonly, crazily sharing one story for the for the purpose of doing so, but doing that ethically and when and where appropriate. So, yeah, um, I I definitely agree with you. I definitely agree with you on that. And um, you know, historically, mistakes is I you know I've overshared once at the very beginning of my journey like 20 years ago and 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 it backfired on me I was too eager I was too codependent I was yeah not experienced enough and that was a real lesson for me I was working in an addiction unit where you know some of the people were very 12 step and very self-disclosing and very this is you know my story and and I think there is absolutely appropriate boundaries around it and mm. timing. And right. but the power threat meaning too is about you, you're right, it's about meeting that person as an equal. Like we're we're not the experts. Right. I mean, I mean, they're coming to see us, but we're not really the experts. We're the we're, we're the mirror, we're the conduit, we're not the fixer. Right. But it, and it's very easy. And I'm speaking from personal experience. It's very easy to feel that you are the expert yeah. when you've taken all these courses and you've gone to school and you're getting these degrees and you're doing all this work. It's very easy to feel like, well, of course I have some answers and I'm going to help this person sitting in front of me, you know, but like you're saying that that's completely <laughs> not really the healthy and helpful way to, to go about doing this. But I want to go back to um, your over disclosure in a sense, because I think a lot of people can learn from that. When you said you kind of over disclosed, um, how, how did that backfire for you? Well, it backfired because there wasn't enough of a relationship and there wasn't enough rapport with the client I was sat with. It was very, very early days. I overdisclosed something in a motivational way to try and go, you can get out of this, you know, because I have. And she'd had a previous therapist that had overdisclosed. There were no boundaries. There was an enmeshment there. So I really uh, was compounding mm. the trauma that she'd had with the previous therapist with absolutely no boundaries who overdisclosed and made the whole therapy about her. So it was re-traumatizing for this client. Yeah. And I actually thought I was going to get fired for it at the time. It, oh the, the complaint came in, a complaint came in from her mother and it went up to the hospital director and to my boss. And I, I'd only been there for two months. <laughs> well, what a, and what I a, still remember it now, guy, 20 yeah. years later. It but was it's incredible. such a valuable lesson, like you said. Yeah. Um, um, all right. Yeah. So as we wind down here, I mean, you've talked a lot about uh, uh, different uh, solutions and trauma modalities, but in terms of a go-to book recommendation, what would you recommend? 
Well, I quite like, just for its simplicity and easy read, I give quite a lot of mine um, Benjamin Fry's Invisible Lion because it's got, it, it really talks about the nervous system in quite an easy way to get your head round. And it's got some quite good doodles and diagrams in it. So, so that in terms of simplicity, I love Jamie Marrick's Trauma and the 12 Steps because a lot of my clients still are in the 12 step movement. But my personal favorite that I love that's got nothing to do with, well, maybe it's got everything to do with trauma actually, is Paolo Coelho's The Alchemist. Mm -hmm. okay. Just everything in it touches my soul. So what's the best way for people to get in contact with you, Lou? Well, they can go to the Trauma Thrivers website um, dot com, and then if they want the ebook, that's on there. There's also a four part free basics of trauma PDF, which is quite handy for clients. Um, if they want to download that, that's for free, and that just talks about the the, the brain co-regulation, what attachment is, how we get soothed in relationships. So that's quite. An, if if anybody would find that useful that's all on the trauma thrivers under freebies and then come join us on facebook if you'd like to okay awesome so you have trauma thrivers and you also have your website lula bents i do okay. i do that's uh, my own personal one-to-one -one website okay which i will be updating because at the moment i'm working more on training so I've been asked to put together quite a lot of training for um, trauma-informed corporates and also for trauma-informing coaches or recovery coaches. Okay. So, um, yeah. And, and also I'm putting together a program for therapists and coaches working on, it's going to be called Five to Thrive, and it will be about finding your vision feeling valuable, being able to put your voice out there and be visible because I know so many, I struggled for like a decade with that guy, yeah. you know, and we need more voices out there. Yeah. Well, your voice is certainly uh, an inspiring one. And, and I mean that, I mean, it's just, for me, this is why I do this to get to talk to people like you who've had your own experience and cannot help, but share it. And, and help others guide others through, through their own journey. And it's, uh, it's awesome. So Thanks. I don't know what the hell took you so long to come on this podcast. <laughs> should have asked you earlier, shouldn't I? I should have I, just I, emailed you and said, yeah, I see that's the voice bit, isn't it? That's the asking for what you, what you'd like. Well, no, it's not. It's for me taking so long to ask you, but it, oh, look, Lou, we, I appreciate it so we much. made it a bit. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank I appreciate it so much. And I hope it's useful for anybody listening. I'm sure it will be. We'll be in touch. Okay. Take All right, care. Take care.